Hey everyone, Riley here with Dark Arrow. We're getting closer to flying the Dark Arrow 1 prototype, but before we fly, we're doing some testing. We're doing what's called a ground vibration test because we're looking at air elasticity, which is how the airflow will interact with the mass and stiffness of the airplane. We want to make sure the airframe isn't going to bend or twist or vibrate in any undesirable ways. Maybe you've heard of flutter or structural divergence. These are things we specifically want to avoid with our design. Part of the way we figure that out is through ground vibration testing. We've had a lot of help on this from Sam Yeager. Sam has an engineering background in air elasticity and he's gonna go over some of the fundamental theory behind air elasticity and explain how ground vibration testing works. All this is important on the Dark Arrow 1 because of the speed and performance we're targeting, but if you're someone thinking about modifying your airplane for more performance, this should be important to you too. Hey everyone, I'm Sam. You've maybe seen me in the background over the past few months. I've been helping out with the vibration testing on the Dark Arrow 1 prototype, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the science of air elasticity. Here's a video showing a wing that I specifically built to vibrate or flutter while driving down the road. Flutter is an air elastic phenomena where the aerodynamics and structural dynamics of the airframe couple to make an unstable dynamic system. The subject of air elasticity studies how air loads deform a structure and how these deformations can alter the performance of the aircraft. Some of these air elastic effects can potentially lead to in-flight structural failure. To understand flutter and air elasticity, the fundamental building block is a mass spring dash pot model. Here I have a mass attached to a spring to visualize the system. Mass of a structure can be represented by a discrete lump mass like this metal block. Stiffness on the other hand of a structure can be modeled as a mechanical spring and this represents how much a structure deforms due to applied forces. Now if I pull this mass spring system and let go, the mass will oscillate back and forth. The rate of oscillation is called the natural frequency of the system. Every vibratory structure will have some natural frequency based on its mass and stiffness. Now, as you can see, the up and down motion of the mass spring system decays and will eventually stop. This effect is known as damping and can be modeled as a dash pot. The dash pot models the damping or how energy is dissipated throughout a structure. Damping is typically expressed in percent as the symbol zeta and in classical structural dynamics, if this ratio is positive, the system is stable and the motion decays. However, if the ratio is negative, the system is unstable and the motion grows in amplitude. We can add degrees of freedom or specific ways a structure can move by adding masses and springs together to approximate a structure's mass and stiffness. Some dynamic systems may only need two or three degrees of freedom to approximate its motion, while others may need thousands. Now when we have multiple degrees of freedom, we begin to see these things called modes. Modes of a structure is a tough concept to grasp, but it is a specific way that a structure likes to move and represents how stiffness and mass are distributed throughout a structure. Modes have a natural frequency, damping, and shape associated with it, and are typically ordered from lowest frequency to highest frequency. For instance, the first mode of an airplane may look like the wings bending up and down together. This animation scales the amplitude so you can more easily see the motion of the mode. This is great and all, but what does this have to do with air elasticity? A simple air elastic model is an airfoil attached to a torsional spring and a linear spring. The torsional spring measures the structural twist of the wing, and the linear spring models the bending motion of the wing. These two degrees of freedom are called the pitch mode and heave mode. The center of gravity, quarter cord, and the point where the springs are attached to the airfoil are generally not in the same place. If the torsional spring is located aft of where the quarter cord is, an air elastic effect known as divergence can occur. As the airfoil generates lift, the airfoil will deform by pitching up. As the airfoil pitches up, the angle of attack increases, which generates more lift and twists the airfoil even more. If the spring stiffness is too small or the dynamic pressure from the airstream is too great, the airfoil will diverge and the pitch angle will go to infinity, meaning the wing will rip off. This is what happened to Samuel Langley, who is actually set to beat the Wright brothers to the first powered flight, but his airplane had a divergence issue and crashed in the Potomac River. 
A more well-known dynamic air elastic phenomena is called flutter. A common type of flutter is when the torsional mode and heave mode of our two degree of freedom system couple to make a flapping motion. We saw this motion in the flutter wing that I made. The main difference between structural vibrations and air elastic flutter is that the aerodynamics add stiffness and damping to the system. This creates a new dynamic system where the modes change with airspeed and air density, which is a function of altitude. The calculation of flutter modes involves a lot of math, but what you get at the end of the analysis or testing are these frequency versus true airspeed and damping versus true airspeed plots. This plot was formulated from a model in an air elasticity textbook. The top plot shows that the pitch and heave mode move closer in frequency as the airspeed increases. The bottom plot shows the damping of each mode also changes with airspeed. The damping in the heave mode becomes more positive as airspeed increases, which makes it stable. However, the damping in the pitch mode decreases and eventually becomes negative. When the damping becomes negative, the amplitude of oscillations increase with time and it can lead to in-flight structural failure or flutter. So the flutter speed is the airspeed when the damping becomes negative. The flutter speed is typically a high airspeed and is the point where the airflow supplies more energy than what the structure can absorb. If we calculate damping for a series of densities or altitudes, we can see that the flutter speed increases with altitude. So it's possible to fly to a high altitude, descend at a constant true airspeed, and fly into flutter. One of the things that can help us understand flutter is performing a ground vibration test prior to high speed flight. During our ground vibration test, natural frequencies, damping, and mode shapes are measured with a technique called experimental modal analysis. This information gives us a better understanding how mass and stiffness are distributed throughout the airframe, as well as how the airframe absorbs energy when there is zero airflow over the wing. Having good modal data on the airframe is the first step in formulating flutter calculations. Behind me is the ground vibration setup that we have. One of the largest components of the ground vibration test is the bungee suspension system. The bungees helps replicate uh, in-flight configuration of the airplane. The bungees add very little stiffness to the structure and also isolate the vibrations so that we can get accurate frequency and damping information. The carts under the airplane are there as a safety precaution if the bungees were to break. We have various points around the airframe where we attach accelerometers to measure the acceleration. This breaks up the continuous airframe structure into discrete points that we can model. A special modal hammer is then used to excite the airframe and measure input force. Again, specific locations around the airframe are picked out to be impact locations. All the accelerometer and hammer data is then fed into a computer where the data is processed to compute frequency, damping, and mode shapes. So how does this all work? We use some tricks from electrical engineering to process the data. First, we use an algorithm called a fast Fourier transform to convert the acceleration and force versus time into acceleration and force versus frequency. The basic idea behind a Fourier transform is that you can represent a complicated vibration as a mixture of simple waves. From here, we can compute these things called frequency response functions, or FRFs. FRFs describe the acceleration response of a structure given an input force. From each FRF, frequency and damping information can be computed. And a set of these FRFs from an array of accelerometers and hammer taps in specific locations show how different points vibrate in relation to each other, otherwise known as mode shapes. As you can probably tell, there's a lot of physics and math that goes into flutter testing and analysis. However, the basic principle is that the mass and stiffness distribution throughout a structure defines its dynamics. A practical example of this would be adding a wingtip fuel tank to a proven airframe. This could alter the mass in a way that could change the dynamics and lower the flutter speed. This is our second round of ground vibration testing. We collected a bunch of data and we've already used it to find the first few basic mode shapes and natural frequencies. This is useful, but we're after flutter speeds and that's gonna come up after some more number crunching. Ultimately, we want to establish a V&E or the never exceed speed for our design, which will be a safe margin below the flutter speeds. More on that later. We're gonna leave it here for now. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next video.